Natural selection acts only by taking advantage of slight successive variations. She can never take a great and sudden leap, but must advance by short and sure, though slow steps. It's really interesting to notice that the more we know about life and the more we know about biology, the more problems Darwinism has and the more design becomes apparent. Since 1988, Dr. Michael B. has investigated complex biological systems that seem to defy explanation by natural selection. For the longest time, I believe that Darwinian evolution explains what we saw in biology. Not because I saw how it could actually explain it, but because I was told that it did explain it. And in schools, I was taught Darwinian biology. And through college and graduate school, I was in an atmosphere which just assumed that Darwinian evolution explained biology. And again, I didn't have any reason to doubt it. It wasn't until about no, ten years or more ago that I read a book called Evolution of Theory and Crisis by a, a geneticist by the na name of Michael Denton, an Australian, and he put forward a lot of scientific arguments against Darwinian theory that I had never heard before, and, and the arguments uh, seemed pretty convincing. And at that point I, I started to get a bit angry because I, I thought I was being led down the primrose path. Here were a number of very good arguments, and I had gone through a, a doctoral program in biochemistry, became a faculty member, and uh, I had never even heard of these things. And so from that point on, I became very interested in, in the question of evolution, and, and uh, since have decided that Darwinian uh, processes are not uh, the whole explanation for life. Michael Behe's skepticism derived in large measure from what modern biology has revealed about life's most fundamental unit, the cell. In the 19th century when Darwin was alive, scientists thought that the basis of life, the cell, was some simple glob of protoplasm, like a little piece of jello or something that was not hard to explain at all. This perception didn't really change too much until the early 1950s. But in the last half century, our knowledge of the cell has just exploded. Today, powerful technologies reveal elaborate microscopic worlds. Worlds so small that a thimbleful of cultured liquid can contain more than four billion single-cell bacteria, each packed with circuits, assembly instructions, and miniature machines, the complexity of which Charles Darwin could never have imagined. At the very basis of life, where molecules and cells run the show, we've discovered machines, literally molecular machines. There are little molecular trucks that carry supplies from one end of the cell to the other. There are machines which capture the energy from sunlight and turn it into usable energy. There are as many molecular machines in the human body as there are functions that the body has to do. So if you think about hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, feeling, blood clotting, respiratory action, the immune response, all of those require a host of machines. When we look at these machines, we ask ourselves, where do they come from? And the standard answer, Darwinian evolution, uh, is very inadequate in my view. In speaking on the topic of scientific naturalism and evolution... During the early 1990s, at a series of academic conferences, Behe first shared his doubts about the ability of natural selection to construct complex molecular machines. One machine particularly attracted his attention. I remember the first time I, I looked in a biochemistry textbook and I saw a drawing of something called a bacterial flagellum with all of its parts in all of its glory. It's had a propeller and the hook region and the, the drive shaft and the motor and, and so on. I looked at that and I said, that's an outboard motor. That, that's designed, you know, that's no chance assemblage of, of parts. Behe's reaction was not surprising. 
For the molecular motors that drive bacteria through liquid, each depend upon a system of intricately arranged mechanical parts. These parts come into focus when portions of a cell are magnified 50,000 times. Biochemists have used electron micrographs like this one to identify the parts and three-dimensional structure of the flagellar motor. In the process, they have revealed a marvel of engineering on a miniaturized scale. Howard Berg at Harvard has labeled it the most efficient machine in the universe. These machines, some of them are running at 100,000 RPMs and are hardwired into a signal transduction or sensory mechanism so that it's getting feedback from the environment. And even though they're spinning that fast, they can stop on a dime. It only takes a quarter turn for them to stop and shift directions and start spinning 100,000 RPM in the other direction. And just like outboard motors on motorboats, it has a large number of parts which are necessary for the motor to work. The bacterial flagellum, two gears, forward and reverse, water-cooled, proton motive force, it has a stator, it has a rotor, it has a U-joint, it has a drive shaft, it has a propeller, and they function. Um, as these parts of machines. It's, you know, it's not convenient that we give them these names. That's truly their function. Since its discovery, scientists have tried to understand how a rotary motor could have arisen through natural selection. As yet, they have failed to offer any detailed Darwinian explanation. To see why, we must understand a feature of molecular machines known as irreducible complexity. When we <clears throat> did Ra and Dr. Chris to Chris's after show, he was mocking the uh, orchard thing that you were trying to make. Oh, Sal, all he wants to talk about is, oh, the protein orchard and topoisomerase as though it's the, the new bacterial flagellum. Well, I'll put it this way. It's it's funny because when Joe DeWeese, you were in that conference with Joe DeWeese, that's kind of what we're saying. This is the new bacterial flagellum and it's gonna, it's even better. Well, number one, why is he mocking the bacterial flagellum? They, they just... claim that they, they have resolved the problem and there's lots of circular reasoning and obfuscation in that because the bacterial flagellum has 40 parts and they said 38 had been, you know, exist elsewhere. Therefore it can be gradually arisen. And so this is why I said, if you avoid the term irreducible complexity, just as if you say it's a way to find things that are unevolvable, it's okay. And or all the parts have to be there. You, well, well if basically, you take an outboard motor and you take away one of the parts, it ain't going to work. And they'll say, oh, well, yes, it will, but it's not. Well, was... One of the problems is they're, they're all the, they're like 38 parts, 38 of the 40 parts pre exist, but you still have to assemble it. But the thing is, is that um, we found examples where that's not the case. <laughs> Topoisomerase doesn't have. It's easier to understand. It's very clear. And so, yeah, you could say it's the new bacterial flagellum. You say, okay, there's a shaft over there. There's a rotor over there. There's a tail somewhere else, and it doesn't have to always be in that configuration. Yeah. Well, it doesn't take away the fact that that configuration needs all those parts to work the way it works. But, but the bottom line is that's, you know, he can say that all he wants. Did he solve the problem? And you know... We sent that letter. We asked for permission to publish it. So do you have verified experimental of, you know, this, the original state, verified, proven, experimentally verified the process that changed it and how you arrived at that state? And they said, uh, they just, they didn't answer the question. They just evaded and said, well, that's not how science works. I know, what you were saying about, they claim that they have explained how the bacterial flagellum could have arisen incrementally, right? Gradually. But if you look at their explanations, 
they haven't. I don't think they've done a good job. I think I think they gave a good attempt, but what's ended up happening is we have the new generation with better data, and and they don't even they don't even show up. At least with the bacterial flagellum, they showed up, but with the topoisomerase, they punt. All they could do is mock. They don't actually deliver an explanation. They know this is problematic because generally for cellular life of any moderate complexity, without it, it's dead. And something dead doesn't evolve. I mean, it's done, you know. Well, I'm pretty sure that even without a bacterial flagellum, it would be dead. Um, no. I know a creationist biologist who demonstrated there are lots of bacteria that had flagellum and they go into a phase where they don't have one and they live fine. But that's not the case with topoisomerase. That's why topoisomerase is a target of chemotherapies. That's why I was excited for you to come to that meeting when Joe DeWeese was talking, an expert in that field, in that protein, because he studied this for 17 years. And you're not going to get some random internet guy or even Aaron Ra challenging someone of that caliber. He knows what he's talking about. Well, I find it stunning that they will attack good scientists like that. That's just par for the course for now. Did you have something else you wanted to explore? The fact that we didn't know that the cell was not a blob of jelly. There are machines inside of this microscopic cell. The bacterial flagellum is only one of, what did he say? How many machines? One for every function in the body. There, there, there's so many. But we will study cellular biology, God willing, in time. So let's watch the next segment. Irreducible complexity was coined by Mike Behe in describing these molecular machines. Basically what it says is that you have multi-component parts to any given organelle or system in a cell all of which are necessary for function. That is, if you remove one part, you lose function of that system. The idea of irreducible complexity can be illustrated by a familiar non-biological machine, a mouse trap. The trap is composed of five basic pieces, a catch to hold the bait, a strong spring, a thin bent rod called the hammer, a holding bar to secure the hammer in place, and a platform upon which the entire system is mounted. If any one of these parts is missing or defective, the mechanism will not work. All components of this irreducibly complex system must be present simultaneously for the machine to perform its function, catching mice. Irreducible complexity also applies to biological machines, including the bacterial flagellar motor. All told, there are about 40 different protein parts which are necessary for this machine to work. And if any of those parts are missing, uh, then either you get a flagellum that doesn't work because it's missing the hook or it's missing the drive shaft or whatever, or it doesn't even get built within the cell. In evolutionary terms, you have to be able to explain how you can build this system gradually when there's no function until you have all those parts in place. The irreducible complexity of molecular machines poses a severe challenge to the power of natural selection. According to Darwin's theory, even very complex biological structures like an eye, an ear, or a heart can be built gradually over time in small incremental steps. Yet, as Darwin made clear, natural selection can only succeed if these random genetic changes provide some advantage to the evolving organism in its struggle for survival. As I have attempted to show, it is not necessary to suppose that the modifications are all simultaneous if they were extremely slight and gradual. Natural selection is scrutinizing the slightest variations, rejecting those that are bad, 
preserving and adding up all that are good. But could Darwin's small, favorable variations have produced a bacterial flagellum? Some scientists doubt the possibility. How could something new, like a bacteria flagellar motor and all the components that go with it, how could it develop out of a population of bacteria that don't have that system? When each change, according to Darwin's theory, has to provide some kind of advantage. Imagine such a scenario early in the Earth's history. An evolving bacterium somehow develops a tail and perhaps even the pieces necessary to attach it to the cell wall. Yet without a complete motor assembly, this innovation would provide no advantage to the cell. Instead, the tail would lie immobile and useless, invisible to natural selection, which by definition can only favor changes that aid survival. The logic of natural selection is very demanding. Unless the flagellum mechanism is completely assembled and actually works, natural selection simply cannot preserve it. It cannot be passed on to the next generation. The important thing to realize about natural selection is it selects only for a functional advantage. In most cases, natural selection actually eliminates things, things that have no function or that have a function that harms the organism. So if you had a bacterium with a tail that didn't function as a flagellum, chances are natural selection would eliminate it. The only way you can select for a flagellum is if you have a flagellum that works, and that means you have to have all the pieces of the motor in place to begin with. So natural selection can't get you the bacterial flagellum. It can only work after the flagellum is there and operating. That was really interesting about it would have to be attached. And that's a trick right there. And even if it's attached, if it's just laying there, and I'm sorry, but the bacterial flagellum has not been debunked, only in their minds. Yeah. And there's certainly, you know, the topi psalm race, they're not even trying. <laughs> they're trying to avoid that one. Just for the viewers, the topi psalm race, the way its role is DNA gets tangled up. If it stays tangled up, you're dead. So the topi race will locate where a tangle is. It will cut one. Why don't you show one. that video? Yeah. The rope showing how the, when the rope gets tangled. I don't know if I have it handy, but what good is it if you have something that just cuts and it doesn't <laughs> untangle and reconnect? It's just going to shred the genome. A lot, of, you know. This is where it's really like, uh, okay, so you're dead. How do you evolve in the next generation? Because you're dead. We're learning more about the chemistry, the biochemistry of life. And we're, we're finding systems like this all over the place. The machines. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing that really stunned me is that it could reconnect. Because there's a big difference between reconnecting something that's just a single strand versus reconnecting like 12 other wires inside yeah each of those 12 wires has to be connected to the right 12 wire on the other side right and isn't a dna strand like that to it's reconnect too, a dna strand and and, and it's even more complicated than that because there's lots of for lack of a better word brownian motion it's shaking around and it's having to find this and it doesn't have a lot of active. I mean, if you ask the biochemist to design this without God's template, good luck, you know, because the one thing you can do is you have to, the way you make the machine is you spell it right. If you write, if you add the right sequence of amino acid, then you can make a machine. Finding that sequence is not easy. <laughs> it, it is brutally difficult. Um, because the way you the way you spell it affects its shape and its function and its operation. And that relationship is not easily figured out. You can't, you know, it's not like in the human world, if you have a piece of wood, you could you could chisel away and put it in the lathe and shape it the way you want. No, in, in DNA, in protein with proteins, you have to spell it. <laughs> and that's very hard. 
So anyway, let's watch the next segment. It's we're getting better to the better and better segments the farther we go along. <laughs> 